uh, everybody. Good day. Um, I'm Mike Rice from Chilla Health Bioconsulting. Uh, welcome to the new uh, modalities panel, Advances in Gene Cell Therapies at SACS Biotech in Europe Forum. Um, Chilla Health Bioconsulting is a knowledge-based consultancy focused mostly in providing strategic uh, guidance uh, based on scientific and clinical insight to help uh, biotech companies basically from inception through product development, licensing, acquisitions. Uh, we have particular expertise in creating value from therapeutic platforms. I have about 25 plus years experience in the gene cell therapy space. Um, and uh, we, we spend a lot of our time actually educating pharma on advanced therapeutic uh, platforms and new modalities and understanding how they fit into their portfolios and, and how they actually do diligence on programs where they don't have, you know, core experience in. And so I, I look forward to today's discussion. We have a very diverse panel um, that basically touches on uh, all sort of, sorts of points within the advanced therapeutics uh, ecosphere from life science, reagents, um, devices, uh, services to therapeutic developers, both, both preclinical seeking platform validation and those that have more advanced clinical stage programs um, and, um, and, 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 and uh, platforms that, that uh, programs that cover both uh, oncology as well as non-malignant diseases and, and regenerative medicines. Uh, I'll be moderating today's session with my co-chair, uh, Rainer uh, Strogmenger from, uh, from Wellington Partners. Um, Rainer, would you like to um, uh, introduce yourself and say a few words of uh, uh, introduction? Yes, thank you very much, Michael. Um, so my name is Rainer Strohmenger. I'm a managing partner at Wellington Partners uh, based in Munich, Germany. Um, I've been with the firm for almost 24 years. Uh, originally, my background is medicine and economics. Um, we have around 450 million euros available for investment or invested in the life science investment area, uh, which I'm adding here at our group. And uh, we're very um, interested in um, the field of, of cell-based therapies, gene therapies. Actually, we currently have uh, four companies in our portfolio that are active in that field. Um, uh, one of our companies, Imadix, um, has gone through a SPAC transaction last year. Uh, it's now listed um, on the NASDAQ um, and has earlier this year published very encouraging uh, clinical results um, for uh, its engine product uh, with, with a very low dose where they did not expect any efficacy, uh, but they uh, actually already at, at the lowest dose um, observed some first anti-tumor activity in solid tumors in, in eight out of 10 patients at, at very late stages of the disease. So uh, there will be um, additional data um, expected in the coming weeks. Uh, we have another company uh, that is uh, privately held called Charisma Therapeutics uh, that is also uh, addressing um, solid tumor uh, diseases with a cell-based uh, product with, with the CARM um, technology, chimeric antigen, antigen receptor macrophages uh, targeting HER2. Um, and they have just announced that they received fast track designation from the FDA. Um, they're also involved in eGenesis, the xenotransplantation company based in Boston. Um, that uh, has um, generated perf-free pigs that can serve as organ donors. And, and the focus is on kidney transplantation and um, cell-based therapies for treatment of type 1 diabetes. And we have another platform company called New Way um, Pharma that is um, using um, uh, the cap seed of an uh, the main protein of, of the cap seed of the JC virus for delivering large molecules through the blood-brain barrier uh, into the CNS 
uh, and they can, for example, transport uh, DNA, mRNA, or also antibodies and deliver that intracellularly, uh, targeting um, genetic diseases of the CNS. So um, I hand over now to the panel participants to introduce themselves. Uh, Miguel, maybe you want to start? Thank you, Rainer, and thank you, Michael, as well. And uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak. Um, uh, good, uh, good day, everybody. Uh, I'm Miguel Fortin, CEO of Bone Therapeutics. I'm an MD, PhD by training, and I've done clinical, academic, regulatory. I was a member of the European Agency. And I've been in industry for quite a while now, and particularly in translational companies over the last 10 plus years. And this is the third technology I'm involved in cell and gene therapy, an autologous Treg, an allogeneic NK-based, um, and now an MSC uh, cell and gene approach that uh, we're developing at Bone Therapeutics. I came to Bone Therapeutics with a perspective of really uh, bringing uh, the technology to the state of the art of uh, cell and gene therapy. And what we're currently doing is taking advantage of our experience previously on MSE derived uh, ALOP, which is an osteoblast osteogenic uh, compound uh, cell base that generates bone, accelerates bone resolution, which we have taken already through two clinical studies and we're currently conducting a control phase 2B accelerating resolution of fractures where we place the cells at the site of fracture. That knowledge that we have on with uh, with uh, ALOP, MSC derived, we're expanding it in a platform which we call IMSC, um, where we condition the cells through growth factors or gene editing to optimize their functionality towards a therapeutic objective. Um, uh, it, it starts, as I said, with the idea that MSCs can form bone and we condition them to that. MSCs have shown before um, some activity and been approved, but challenged as well in indications like graft versus host disease and immunomodulation, ARDS. And so the hypothesis is that we can optimize that functionality by selecting and increasing genetically editing factors that are relevant for that functionality. And so we have already in preclinic uh, BT20, which is uh, targeting acute lung injury. Uh, and we aim to expand that to other immunomodulatory conditions, as well as uh, other indications that we've not disclosed. The three priorities that we have are continue and deliver on our clinical data. The study that is ongoing should deliver data uh, by the end of next year, aiming at being recruited before the end of the first half. Um, the second priority is really to increase collaborations, uh, both outgoing, and we've licensed um, ALOP for Asia uh, with two, uh, two Chinese companies. So commercialization outwards, but inwards as well, bringing in technology um, in terms of complementing our know-how and experience on MSCs with uh, the elements that uh, we believe add on to the platform. And then obviously focusing on expanding the indications and aiming at having additional um, targets in the clinic by 2023. Thank you, Miguel. Uh, Regan, do you want to go next? Yeah, thanks, Rainer. So, hey everyone, I'm Regan Jarvis. I'm co-founder and CEO at Anoka. Um, my background's in basic science. Uh, I'm a biochemist by training, trained in my native New Zealand and then postdocs in, uh, in Germany at the German Cancer Research Center. So Anoka, I co-founded back in 2014. <clears throat> and basically the company is built around an analytical platform, which is built on a range of cell-based assay sub-platforms. <clears throat> and they're all built for different types of precise and, and reproducible and scalable analysis of T-cell biology in general. And we first focused on TCR-modified uh, cell therapies in the oncology space. Uh, and our assays to support this span from basic target discovery, <clears throat> more specifically HLA-restricted epitope uh, uh, discovery and characterization, which of course TCR targets, a TCR discovery element, uh, but most importantly, a TCR characterization element or several elements to this platform, which is all about safety profile. And, and in regards to TCR-based therapies, that's the major 
major challenge here is, is the safety profiling of TCRs preclinically to both select assets coming out of your profile uh, in the pipeline, but also to, to de-risk uh, the assets you put into clinic. Using this platform, we've generated a very deep pipeline of TCR assets, um, and we've, we've built out our own manufacturing capability uh, near Stockholm in, in former AstraZeneca facilities. To date, the company's raised uh, well over $100 billion. Uh, the, the latest round, Series B, uh, just this summer was about $50 million. <clears throat> and we're using that to expand the team, uh, which is currently around 70 headcount, overwhelmingly scientific and development staff, and particularly investing into our manufacturing capabilities uh, and scaling uh, for targeting our first in, in human studies with assets out of our own pipeline moving into the next couple of years. So happy to be here and, and to contribute to the discussion. Thank you, uh, Paul. Do you want to introduce yourself? Sure, Rainer, thank you. Uh, my name's Paul Rennert. I'm um, co-founder, president, and CSO of Alita Biotherapeutics. Uh, we're a privately held um, company outside of Boston. We develop biologics and cell therapeutics um, based on a platform uh, that we call CAR-T engagers. So, you know, my background is, um, was deeply embedded in biologics development, first at Replogen in the, in the 90s and then uh, Biogen for 15 years, where we worked a lot on, on uh, biologic modalities, fusion proteins, antibodies, and, and so on. And we've sort of rolled that um, that technological experience up into this class of of proteins called CAR T engagers, as the name implies, one part of these multifunctional proteins has to engage a CAR domain. So in our lead program, that component is CD19, and the CAR T engager is developed to be provided to patients who've received an approved anti-CD19 CAR T cell, the business end of that molecule binds to CD20. So if you understand how relapses occur in that setting of B-cell lymphoma and B-cell leukemia, it's driven by and large by loss of the CD19 antigen in the face of natural selection. So we simply paint CD19 on every expressed copy of CD20, thereby reactivating the cars and keeping them active during that first critical three months uh, after the patient receives the cell therapy. If you can keep a patient in a CR through 90 days, 120 days, they end up being out on the long tail, as we've seen from you know Zuma 1 and from the early Eliana work. If we can put patients into durable remissions, we can actually now affect cures with cell therapeutics. So that's a biologics program. We added an anti-albumin VH to extend the half-life using old Ablinks technology. Um, and the program, you know, was picked up by Cancer Research UK for clinical development through phase two. So we're, we're filing the regulatory documents now, making the drug and advancing that program uh, quickly as the first example of the platform. But the platform is quite broad. Uh, we can build biologics. We can secrete CAR-T engagers because they're small, 50 KD, 60 KD, we can encode them into a lentiviral vector and put them inside the CAR T cell. So now you would have a CAR to antigen one that secretes a CAR T engager that recognizes antigens two and three. So without a whole lot of genetic engineering at the level of the cell, you get multiple antigen recognition from a single CAR domain. We think that's a very powerful motif. I'll mention, um, that uh, the technology is agnostic as to the underlying cell type. So we work with autologous CAR T cells because that's what's approved, but it'll work with ALO, it'll work with NK, it'll work with Charisma's macrophage CARs. We've actually made a CAR T engager with the relevant domain of HER2 as the CAR T engager um, component. So our programs cover multiple myeloma. There the CAR T engager component is BCMA. B cell malignancies, CD19, solid tumors, a variety of antigens. So the, the platform is feeding the pipeline. Um, we've um, fertilized the pipeline by uh, bringing in a series B, uh, which will close um, shortly, in the next maybe two to three weeks. 
uh, as well as the um, generous support of Cancer Research UK. So we're, we're anxious to move forward as a company and, and grow over the next few years. I'll stop there. Thank you. Very interesting. Um, Mai, um, please tell us about your background and your company. Sure, thanks. Um, I appreciate this opportunity. Um, my name is Madeline Canero. I'm the Chief Medical Officer at Marker Therapeutics. My background is um, I have an MD PhD. Um, my PhD is actually in T cell biology, um, studying um, T cell dysfunction specifically um, in different animal models, particularly colon cancer. Um, my oncology training um, actually was at Sloan Kettering, where I um, worked with um, on CAR T cell technology, actually, um, in both human malignancies as well as solid tumors, as, um, and particularly in the solid tumor space, the ovarian CAR, which later was um, in the in the Juno pipeline um, with a CAR that's specific against MUX16, actually. Um, I have, uh, my background is, uh, in addition, um, working on um, various antibodies, small molecules, but all in the immuno-oncology space. Um, and now at Marker Therapeutics, um, you know, here we're actually focused on T cell based immunotherapies as well. The difference being uh, we work with non engineered T cells and um, for both um, heme malignancies as well as solid tumor indications. Um, the lead candidate um, is the multi TA or multi tumor associated antigen specific T cell technology, um, which is our main focus. And here, the idea here um, is that we selectively expand um, tumor-specific T cells that recognize um, particular antigens um, that can then go and um, kill tumor cells once infused into the patient. And the idea is to um, pull out the, the T cells that we think um, will target these um, four to five particular tumor antigens. And so... Um, by doing that, you can actually have a broad spectrum of anti-tumor activity um, once it's administered. Um, and we feel that this is particularly important given um, inherent heterogeneity that's associated with many different tumor types, um, particularly in, in solid tumors. And we can do this without the need for lymphodepletion. Um, we have uh, two particular um, product candidates. One is the autologous T cells. And those um, T cells are actually used for indications such as lymphoma, multiple myeloma, and um, solid tumors. And we also have an allogeneic T cell program that we use for um, acute myeloid um, leukemia as well as um, ALL. Um, and because of the fact that we don't um, genetically engineer them, um, we feel that um, this decreases cost of manufacturing. Um, ultimately, and um, also uh, ultimately it has um, lower toxicities associated with it um, than typical CAR T cells. Um, and we feel that um, there's the added benefit of the um, epitope spreading that we're seeing um, because of the fact that we don't require anyone for the patient for this technology. Um, so the patient's own immune system is able to contribute um, due to the inflammatory response from the initial infusion and expansion of the cells into the patient. Um, so we're, we're quite excited. Um, we, have, we do have a lead program that's in phase two development in AML um, that opened up the end of last year. Um, so we have um, expecting a, a Q, um, Q1 readout in our relapsed post-transplant AML population. Um, so we're very excited about that. And, and I'm looking forward to the discussion today in, in this panel. So thanks for the opportunity. Thank you very much. And finally, Michael. Please introduce very, yourself. Very good. Good afternoon. And uh, my name is Michael McGuire. I'm CEO and co-founder of Avectus. Um, I'm delighted to join this illustrious panel today and to, um, to participate in the discussion. Um, Avectus is a, a company I co-founded some years back um, to address some of the critical challenges in intracellular delivery. And that happened at the time that we saw the rise and rise of gene modified cell therapy and the growing need for manufacturing technologies, which is uh, present. Um, in terms of the business end of Avectus, um, we're approximately 40 people uh, based in uh, outside of Dublin in Ireland. Our chief business officer is based in Cambridge, Mass. 
and we have a, a presence in J Labs in Toronto uh, as well. Um, we've raised uh, in excess of $40 million um, and um, we've developed uh, with that a, a platform called Solupore. So the thesis around uh, Solupore and the need for this manufacturing platform is that the current uh, generation of gene modified cell therapies uh, typically have a a single transgene modification, which is brought about by viral transduction. That's the most embedded technology um, in the, the industry. Uh, we see the, the rise and rise of uh, need uh, and affinity for non-viral uh, uh, transfection methods. And the drivers for that are as we move from the current generation of commercialized products to the next generation of products, these are products that will need to address allogenicity and they will need to address solid mass tumors. And in both cases, um, it's our expectation that we're going to see more engineering of cells, more editing, more modifications. We're going to see hybridization of viral and non-viral modification. Uh, we're going to see um, increased um, amounts of whether it's editing down or, or introducing factors to build up iPS cells, whatever it is, we're going to see an increased um, need and demand for, um, uh, for engineering solutions. Um, as some of the other panelists have, uh, have said, um, this is a real challenge because the more you uh, interact with cells, the more, um, uh, the more toll is taken, more toxicity and so forth. So manufacturing is a real challenge. And what our platform, which is called Solupore, which is a, a, a gentle uh, membrane permeabilization uh, technique, um, what, what we do is we, um, we modify cells with a minimum of perturbation. Um, there is uh, a, a, a number of it. There's a, a, a growing industry in electroporation, for instance, and we see up to 20 other um, technologies, everything from mature to nascent for all sorts of ways of getting things into to cells. But what the, the market is seeking is the, the most gentle, least perturbing way of getting lots of things into cells in and, and, and thereby condensing process times as well. So uh, we're very excited about where the, the industry at, the fact that our capability, um, uh, our platform is on a journey towards GMP, um, it, it's already GMP aligned and towards getting it into clinical programs. We met with the FDA in terms of regulatory progression. We met with the FDA on the 16th of March this year. So we're excited about the progression of our company, the, the need in the market. And lastly, and most critically, the, the lifeblood is commercialization. So we're looking at a, a, a partnership and licensing model um, and bringing our technology uh, into use with partners in gene modified cell therapy uh, processes. Looking forward to the, uh, to the discussion uh, for the remainder of the afternoon. Great, thank you. And um, thank you everybody for, for your introductions. It's very clear that you know, this is a very um, rich area for innovation, um, hearing all the diversity of approaches and, um, and areas that, that you're, you're developing. Um, I, I want to get into the discussion, but you know, maybe we can just set the context. You know, um, over the last uh, three years, it's really been an unprecedented time for you know bi biotech overall, but you know, particularly advanced cell therapy, uh, gene and cell therapies. Um, there's been uh, 78 uh, IPOs, I, I believe, in 2020. Uh, this year. Uh, we're, we are heading, I think, about 60 through um, the, the first three quarters. So uh, we're on track to, to maybe be another record year for, for IPOs. Uh, venture financing last year was $20 billion. Uh, this year, we're, we're, we're up uh, $60 billion going into new uh, uh, emerging companies um, and technology platforms. And, it, and it's been driven by you know, this rich area of innovation, the fact that we've gotten you know, validation of a variety of uh, gene and cell therapy platforms, AB gene therapy, um, CAR T cells, 
mesenchymal stem cell therapies, um, ex vivo modified uh, hematopoietic stem cells, uh, and other modalities. If you include the RNA therapeutics, um, obviously mRNA therapeutics was the you know platform of the year, um, driving sixty billion dollars just from two products uh, in, in, into the market. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll see how that plays out going, going into um, the following years, um, depending on where the pan pandemic uh, goes. But you know, it's a it's a rich area where we're we're we're, we're driving innovation from on multiple fronts, um, and um, and and it, it it's driving more investment into the area. Um, so it's been a banner year for 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 2021. Um, let's see what happens in the future. Is this going to continue or, or, or is the party coming to the end uh, in, in 2022 and 2023? Um, we'll see. You know, it, 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 um, I think the, the analysts, I uh, think the party's uh, still going to continue. Um, in five years, they're expecting the gene and cell therapy sector uh, revenues of commercialized products to exceed $30, $30 billion. Um, and um, again, it's, it's, it's driving, derived from a, a diverse uh, set of, of therapeutics in multiple therapeutic areas. Um, so with that said, um, you know, I'd probably like to hand it back to, to Rainer to start the discussion. I, I just want to understand, you know, from an investor perspective, uh, you know, given the investments that you described, which were quite, you know, exciting, um, you know, why is this sector so, so interesting to investors? Yeah, as, as you already mentioned, I mean, there is uh, a lot of highly innovative technologies coming up in, in this field. And um, yeah, looking at um, the opportunities with the eyes of a physician, um, there are some things that you people have just failed to achieve with classical uh, strategies. And um, uh, I, I'm personally extremely excited about the opportunities that cell-based therapies provide. And um, that is, uh, of course, I mean, uh, uh, we have two companies in the cancer field um, so we are strong believers that this may be um, a breakthrough uh, in treatment of, of um, solid tumors. Um, but there are also many other indication areas um, uh, where cell-based therapies can play a significant role. And um, uh, I think there are also... Um, and there's also the opportunity maybe to develop a product faster if you can manage the production side. And um, yeah, would be very interested to hear um, some comments on that from, from the other participants, how your perception is from the investor view on that as, as you're talking to investors, for example, uh, maybe, maybe Paul, you can tell us a little bit about what is your impression, how the investors see that. The manufacturing component is complicated um, and fraught with risk. I think we all understand that. Um, and that's true across um, cell and gene. It's not particular to cell therapy. Um, I think the issues there have been confounded by the fact that until recently, much of that manufacturing expertise was consolidated in the hands of relatively few CDMOs that one could work with. This is in the viral vector field um, and further confounded by the fact that uh, we're learning as we go how to make CAR T cells, right? So what the winning formula is going to be there at the end of the day patient-derived point of care, patient-derived central manufacturing, allogeneic, um, or other, you know, we, we don't know yet. And I think it's likely to be the case that one size will not fit all indications across oncology. And so we will continue to have a variety of manufacturing uh, 
capabilities um, or opportunities to, to move different cell therapeutics forward. For a small company, it can be very daunting to try to figure out how to navigate the viral and CAR T cell manufacturing ecosystem. Um, we've chosen a pretty standard path, I think, working closely with established viral vector manufacturers and then working closely with um, well-practiced academic centers to make the cars. We'll worry about process transfer later, right? But for right now, you know, the goal is to move the cell ther therapeutic arm of the company into the clinic, get proof of concept, and then we'll, you know, we'll tackle the bigger manufacturing issues. Do we put, you know, shovels in the ground and build a manufacturing capability, for example, you know, we'll deal with that with that issue later. I should say that, you know, the biologics side of the house has none of these issues because there we're simply plugging into a, you know, 30 year old established infrastructure for manufacturing biologics. So we have two really different um, platforms, just depending on how we choose to deliver the CAR T engager to the patient, whether as a biologic, as a CAR, and I should mention, we can also deliver them via oncolytic viral therapy. So we're, we end up being in all three buckets just by virtue of the breadth of the platform. May I add some color to that actually? Because um, I think your point, Reiner, about manufacturing has got two aspects. One is the technical one, the other one is the business one. On the technical one, I think the challenges are out there for cell and gene therapy. And uh, the recent discussions with FDA in terms of challenging product characterization, potency, um, and we know that 70% of regulatory discussions are about CMC topics, right, manufacturing. So that is a technical element, which, as you said, if you harness the product, if you harness the manufacturing, you harness the product. The other one is um, how to invest and prepare for the different stages of manufacturing, the strategic approach to manufacturing, which is a business issue. Um, I mean, most companies will probably start outsourcing and eventually build um, and then eventually scale up um, either inside or, or, or through deals. Actually coming into a bone therapeutic, just to give us a specific example, the manufacturing, which was geared from an autologous perspective, as we had evolved our knowledge and aid perspective, became a burden rather than a benefit. So we divested it, um, reducing cost, increasing flexibility, and getting a return together with a supply agreement. Uh, and for the supply agreement, you may have multiple options. It's important that you have a culturally fit together with the organization you're going to work with, because you own the process, you need to continue to own it you need to transfer it and you need to feel comfortable. So that's that element in terms of uh, optimizing costs, operations, and, uh, and, and, and looking towards the future. And all of this while we kind of scale up to 3D manufacturing, uh, just being ready to the commercialization state when we come to. So key topic uh, on the discussions in terms and different investors, and you may comment to that, will have a different perspective of it. Some may want you to own a lot of it. Others may want you to have a good, flexible approach to it. Uh, bottom line, both want the product, but the business model is very important. Yeah. Yeah, very, very interesting. And interesting that, you know, it was the first question that uh, Reagan um, asked from, from the um, um, uh, investor perspective. I'm sorry, Rainier um, asked from the um, uh, uh, respect, uh, investor perspective. Um, you know, and, and I think it addressed that, you know, investors are getting more comfortable in this space, investing in early stage pre-POC programs and uh, focus a little bit more on what things might cause regulatory um, setbacks or what uh, might cause, um, you know, inability to address, um, uh, you know, broader segments of the market because of complexity of manufacturing and, and logistics. Um, you know, and, and, and the, the panelists have, have you know, a, a, a wide variety of different uh, manufacturing processes that uh, may dictate their, their business model at the end of the day. Um, so I'd like to hear from, from you know, others on the panel. Um, maybe, my can, can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, your viewpoints of uh, 
manufacturing and um, you know addressing the market. Yeah, happy to. Um, you know, we talked about you know um, trying to get um, you know early on working with academic collaborators, and you know at Marker we we absolutely agree with that. Um, we've been fortunate enough to partner with Baylor College of Medicine where this technology was born and have early you know clinical studies there. And really what that afforded us was this opportunity to you know, look at the data and figure out where the high amount medical need was and in particular indication, be able to move um, you know, those particular studies forward. And that's kind of how you know, we made that decision about moving forward with the, the phase two AML study that I referred to earlier. Um, but with that, you know, as you as you build, you know, the early studies or the manufacturing occurred at the academic center itself. But as you build studies, you have to think about how you can scale up the manufacturing. And unfortunately, um, you know, those academic institutions may not be able to kind of keep up with these larger scale studies and then ultimately commercialization. So, you know, how do you as a small company, how do you um, sort of um, deal with those issues? And so, you know, Mark, we looked at various options, including the, that CDMO route um, and, and trying to contract it with a vendor. But, you know, in cell, cell and gene therapy, um, you know, the process is extremely important. And, you know, do you, can you trust that that, you know, vendor will be able to manufacture in the style that will, you know, uh, keep the characteristics of the product ultimately? And obviously there have been a lot of examples where, there can be issues that, that happen. And you also have to understand that those vendors are, you're actually competing with other companies um, for opportunities to manufacture with them. So uh, it, it can ultimately lead to, to a lot of um, difficulties. Um, so we also looked at potential ways to in, for in-house manufacturing. Um, and, and one uh, is obviously that brick and mortar and building from scratch. Um, and, and that obviously costs a lot of time and money um, trying to, to build up. Um, but the, uh, actually, there are other uh, ways to, to, to address that um, beyond just uh, the sort of brick and mortar. And, and that's considering maybe modular clean rooms um, that you, you can purchase versus even uh, an, another option being prefabricated clean rooms um, that you can install in, into existing um, you know, structure and, and, um, and hook up utilities to. And we actually went that route. Um, and I think it's afforded us the ability to scale up um, as well as we go into potential commercialization. So it can meet the needs of a larger study. And then ultimately, um, you know, we can continue to add additional clean rooms um, as we you know, move towards commercialization. So that I think has um, been one huge benefit for us is to really move manufacturing in-house to allow us to control the process and, um, you know, but yet keep the cost down and yet still be able to, to scale up as well. So all of those things um, are issues that companies that are starting out are dealing with. But I agree with Paul that initially um, working with an academic collaborator, but then you have to think about these other issues as you, you know, um, build your programs and, and go into um, larger registration studies. Yeah, and just to make a quick comment or a question to to follow up, you know, the one of the things about the slot model you mentioned not really being able to work with CD, CDMOs on the cell manufacturing and the slot model is can be really unfriendly for patients, right? And I think, you know, for AML, you you've really got to turn cells around quickly. Even I don't know what the situation is in the the, the post-transplant adjuvant setting in terms of time required to get cells back to those patients. But I like the plug-in module idea. That's really cool. Yeah, I think it's um, been able to uh, afford us um, a lot of flexibility, like you mentioned, um, and yet um, in a more cost-effective manner um, as opposed to, you know, building a a manufacturing facility from, from scratch. Maybe I can just add, add to that in terms of, you know, there are lots of layers of complexity here and how that relates to, to the business model and how that maybe resonates with investors. So, you know, our focus as a company has been in the fundamental analytical technologies and the ability to target discovery <clears throat> and generate assets. 
and, and that's built a lot of you know, internal expertise in, in cell and molecular biology, <clears throat> which we've been able to leverage by you know, investing in not necessarily brick and mortar, breaking new ground and building a facility, but converting you know, former AstraZeneca facilities into a cell therapy manufacturing plant. And that's allowed us to, you know, in parallel, you know, build out quite an extensive process development team, recognizing, hey, you can have the best assets in the world, you know, cars or TCRs, but you still have to manufacture a very high quality product. And there are lots of different, different challenges there. The auto versus allo, you know, donor allogeneic, you know, viral, non-viral, um, you know, the types of armoring and other edits that you might want to do. Also, the, the size of the cargo you have to deliver to those cells can be quite limiting in some of those methodologies. So what, what we've been doing you know, very actively in the last 12 months is, is really seeking pair-pair collaborations with, with other biotechs who have you know, the types of tools, molecular, genetic, cell-based, you know, IPSC-like tools, with which you can assemble more powerful you know, manufacturing methodologies. Because again, it comes back to, you know, you can have a great target and a great asset, but if, unless you can deliver that, that, um, that in a, you know, a reproducible, high-quality manufacturing context, that, that's worthless. And so our business model really has been to control the infrastructure, use our scientific expertise and, and, and collaborations to bring in you know, the highest quality manufacturing we can achieve over time. And, and that's not a one-stop shop, obviously. But we're, I wouldn't say, agnostic to you know, what the solution might or the solutions will be here eventually. But... At the same time, it's, it's particularly important for TCRs. I mean, we have a deep pipeline because that's the way that TCR targets work. The whole promise of TCRs is the extremely rich target space, right? So you've got to be able to leverage. You know, it's a rich target space, but highly segmented. So you, know, so you need to be able to leverage a deep portfolio quickly into parallel development. So that implies that it should be allergenic, maybe off-the-shelf type of manufacture, but there are intermediate steps there as well. So... You know, this is a, you know, a flexible approach, being able to control infrastructure, you know, the brick and mortar, the process development capabilities, and then uh, dovetail in different manufacturing approaches, we think has resonated very well with, with our current investor base. So it's, you know, th there's a lot going on in this space and a lot of investment in manufacturing driven by this CAR-T um, you know, wave of, of approvals and development. So you know, it's a very exciting time uh, as a scientist and as a, as a CEO in this space. Yeah, my comments. Um, uh, I think this has been well covered by 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 the panel. But my comments are um, that um, it depends what your product or your portfolio is, um, what kind of facilities are you know what what the the facilities are you going to need, and what the risk and the cost associated with those is. If you're making a car T or a car NK or a, car, you know, a macrophage or something like that. Um, you're going to need to look at viral um, and manufacture for persistence and so forth. Uh, if you're looking at modifying uh, products through uh, gene editing, uh, you may uh, be looking at non-viral um, methods or platforms, uh, which may have less infrastructural impact or um, challenge associated. Um, and of course, there's the space in the middle where you want the persistence of a of a virally based product, but you also want to condition that product to either be allogeneic by knocking out factors or to operate in the tumor microenvironment by um, looking at checkpoints or, or various other uh, conditioning steps that you, you may want to edit out, edit in or, or tweak in, in the cell. Um, it's our view that um, uh, I, I don't think there's going to be a, um, a big change from for instance, autologous, and then one day we'll all wake up and it'll be allogeneic. I, I think autologous products are going to run for, for a long time based on the, the successes and the, the clinical need to date. I think they will, in my view, become the, the preserve of the, um, the, the clinical hospital manufacturing environment, the MD Andersons, the UPens, and, and the Fred Hutches, all of those, those type of environments. I think the allogeneic products, in, in my view, um, may become the preserve of a handful of very high-tech and infrastructurally deep CDMOs who have kitted themselves up appropriately for, for flexibility in that. So I, I see a bit of a a, a, a bifurcation in, um, in how products are made. 
But ultimately, coming back to the initial point, it depends what your portfolio is, depends what you're making, what the range of facilities and infrastructure that you're going to need to manufacture and commercialize that in a way that investors are going to buy into. Yeah. Great. Um, I'd like to turn it back to, to Rainer, um, and, and maybe we could shift gears a little bit and talk about the um, financing env- environment. Um, I know a couple of the panelists uh, have gone through some pretty significant uh, venture financings this year, um, as well as access to non-dilutive uh, financing as well. Um, so, so Rainer, what, what you know from the investor perspective, you know, how do you sense the the investment environment and um, what sort of things are you looking for from these novel technologies? Yeah, um, uh, we. Um, I, I think it has already been mentioned that um, there is quite a diverse view of by investors on different opportunities in that field, and um, uh, you know we traditionally. Um, have always been looking at at new um, opportunities uh, mainly from a medical perspective, you know, what can be achieved um, uh, based on the data that is available, um, how um, probable is it that this can be shown in, in human patients um, and then, of course, um, the additional complexity of can can that be manufactured to standards that are uh, sufficiently um, uh, 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 standardized um, uh, so that it can actually become a commercial product um, that is making also a, a good margin. And... Um, you know, we especially look for opportunities that are highly differentiated. Um, and of course, that needs to uh, be compared with any other approaches that are being developed. And, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm especially also, I mean, as an investor, you always need to have uh, an exit strategy in mind. And um, this is, of course, in in such a new field, uh, it may become a challenge. I mean, it has uh, been mentioned earlier that we are in a in a very unique time where uh, we we see a record number of IPOs, and um, basically, uh, um, I, I think virtually companies can pursue a standalone strategy going that route. And I think many companies are planning for that. And I would be very interested also to hear from the other um, panel participants, uh, what are the alternatives for you? I mean, who will buy your companies? What do you have to show for that? Um, uh, And is, is it going to be the pharmaceutical industry? Um, Do they have enough uh, knowledge also to to do that, or do we need new consolidators? What what is your opinion? I'll I'll kick it off. For several things. First, as a listed company, uh, it's it is uh, it is challenging to drive that resilience. Right, which is once you get to a certain stage on long-term technology like this to keep investor interest. And uh, uh, because as you said, there, there, is, there is a need for an exit at a certain time. I think key to everything is always the equity story. And you said it, I mean, what do you bring? What is the, the, value, the value proposition? But then second is how long you're gonna be able to eventually drive uh, the interest, keep the interest, and eventually then deliver. Uh, Particularly if the technology needs to evolve and do some flip-flops in terms of uh, rejuvenating rejuvenating itself. That's a difficult word. Um, So uh, 
it is important for, for us, what we look from investors is that understanding that technical understanding and expectations for the long-term run uh, and being able to go with us up until the moment of that exit. Now, what could those exits be? Yes, I think uh, I think big pocket, big pharma coming in. And we're seeing that not just because of herd mentality, but also because of true interest. And I think big pharma is going to look, they, they understand that cell and gene therapy is a business now. It's a viable business. It's coming value, to, bringing value to patients. That's why it's a viable business. So they will, they will come. But you may also have to do others in terms of aggregating, combining more than one company, so just to keep, get critical mass, which is another, another thing that, that may be required to, to, to do. And then potentially you can also go alone, but I think going alone probably will be the less frequent, not necessarily the exception, but the less frequent and the hardest, and it will all depend on the value of your equity story anyway. Let me follow on from that, Miko. I mean, <clears throat> I, I agree with a lot of that. In, in our particular field of, of T cell therapies, you know, I, I mentioned it earlier that the, the, the manufacturing slash formulation, whatever you want to call it, is incredibly challenging and complex and, and lots, of, lots of players in that game. You know, ultimately, you know, we're seeing a very strong interest from the big pharma and that, you know, ultimately the complexity of, of not just the manufacturer, but the logistics and, and the you know, the more personalized sales forces and, and MSLs that really need to go behind that, <clears throat> that's going to be a big farmer activity. You know, a biotech of, of a small scale to grow into that role as, as a massive you know, capital intensive challenge, just, just technically as well. So you're going to see, I think, you know, what Miguel says, aggregation. And you know, that, that starts with the biotechs, you know, finding good pair collaborators to aggregate the the skills and the technology you need to drive products you know, into clinical and through clinical development, and whether they're taken up directly by big pharma or or they're aggregating their own models, you know, that that I think is is what we're going to see both of. You know, they're, they're going to snap up you know, products standalone and license those, but they're going to aggregate their own manufacturing and, and you know, sales force, even sell force, to make this a reality. So you know, you need that long term vision. You know, that biotechs really can't have. I mean, these are 20-year horizon projects, right, to deliver these to the market. So, you know, again, it's, it's an exciting time for this, this all cell and gene therapy, but uh, you know, consolidation and aggregation is going to be the name of the game, both at biotech and pharma. Right? Yeah. My, my perspective and, and what we, we see on the ground, we're seeing increased activity um, of technology aggregators so I spoke in my last comments about um, the formation of CDMOs, uh, almost super CDMOs, high-tech CDMOs, whatever word you want to put on it, where um, they are buying up technologies which will give them an edge on manufacturing products with a view simply to selling those products down the line to make, to be able to make the uh, wonderful uh, uh, therapeutic products which are being developed in uh, in research facilities around the world to 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 get those to give them a realistic regulatory pathway and and ultimately get them to patients there there, there is a, a phenomenal activity right now in the market buying up technologies putting them together to provide these flexible offerings that's what we're seeing and so we see aggregation in, in products we also see it in technologies I wonder, Rainer, what do you think about MPM's, you know, move with Elevate Bio and those kinds of, you know, build your own ecosystem approaches? That's a, a different way of tackling the, the question of how to invest in the manufacturing and, and innovation part of this business. Yeah, I think we, we are... Um, uh, as mentioned earlier, I, I think we currently see uh, a lot of different strategies here, uh, which I think is also very good, is not only very good for, for the area, it's, it's also very good for companies that are um, seeking financing, as far as I understand that, uh, because, you, I mean, you need to find an investor that believes in your strategy, but not every investor thinks the same. 
And I, I think this is, um, uh, I think this is quite typical now in this area. And um, uh, I, I think it has really changed from um, how investors approached biotech maybe five to 10 years ago. But there were some major trends where everybody jumped on that. I think one thing I'll add is that, um, you know, Barker actually has been able to take advantage of a, a secret grant, um, which is a Cancer Prevention Research Institute, Texas, um, it's in particular to try to grow more biotechs in, in Texas. And I imagine other, other areas have similar grant opportunities as well. And it's actually um, awarded us about $13 million um, for us to, you know, uh, invest in our phase two um, clinical portion, particularly in the, the adjuvant group, um, post-transplant um, AML patients. Um, so there are other uh, sources as well that could, could help um, you know, further um, advance um, platforms, et cetera, and technologies. So what, what uh, do people believe here? Is it more important to move forward fast and um, hope that, I mean, there will be companies specialized on production uh, that will then help you clear all the um, production issues that may come up, but you, al you already have a, a good pitch to investors? I mean, maybe I can say that, no, we're not banking on that, that happening by itself naturally. So yeah, we control that infrastructure, we aggregate the technologies we need to, to build the best quality product with our assets. You know, because you know, the, the field for T-cell therapies, CAR or TCRs, you've got to have an asset, you know, your API, you've got to have your manufacturing formulation. They're quite distinct challenges here. So I think it's a, you know, an incorrect strategy to hope for the best. You need to control that, take the bull by the horns. So, and certainly that's our approach to the field. Great. Well, thank you. I think we're, we're just about every, about out of time. Um, you know, just, just to leave a, a final thought, I mean, anybody want to comment on how we start it? You know, it's, it's, it, it sounds like there's great enthusiasm from, from all the panelists and, um, you know, it doesn't seem like the party's uh, over at all. So um, any um, thoughts into going forward into 2022 and 2023? You know, I guess we always just say, um, you know, we're going to go as fast as we can, and we're anxious to uh, show clinical uh, results as quickly as we can. And that will be beginning in 2022, 2023. So um, that's where we are, and we'll stay the course until then. Great. A second that. Yeah, I've said it for the third time now, exciting times. Great to be a scientist in this field at the moment. Uh, lots going on, lots, lots to achieve with, with great collaborations and partnership. I agree with all of those things and to keep uh, patient focused uh, in terms of our efforts. And I, I think the environment um, is, that we currently see is very positive to highly innovative companies. I mean, there is lots of money around and the challenge is just to convince the investors, but they also need to put their money to work. Well said. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much. I think this concludes our panel for today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Thank you. Thank you.